It's a pleasure to introduce to talk to you about Mark Halpern. He's been researching his Galician ancestry for 20 years. While most genealogists become interested in their family history in their home country and then travel to their ancestral Stetlach, Mark was on business in 1996 in Poland when he first got the bug. So he had visited that there already. In retirement, Mark spends his free time working with JRI Poland, Jewish Gen, IAJGS, and the JGS of Greater Philadelphia, helping others research their roots in Eastern Europe, especially Poland and Galicia. Mark is a board and executive group member of JRI Poland, the founder of the Bialystok Area Jewish Genealogy Group, and past president and program vice president of the JGS of Philadelphia. Mark has chaired the program committees for the 2009 and 2013 conferences in Philadelphia and Boston, and is leading the team looking into hosting the 2018 conference in Warsaw, Poland. Um, just as an aside, I actually, Mark was the first genealogy friend uh, I met. We met each other by phone, uh, by email, in 1997 because of our common roots in Patterson, New Jersey. Mark? up so you can hear me. I hope you can hear me. So, Shalom Galicianers. Genealogy is all about connections. One of those connections Ronnie just mentioned, which is Patterson, New Jersey for me and her. Uh, it's connecting people to other people, connecting people to places, connecting people to historical events, and just connections to connections. I hope all of you will find new connections at this conference and maybe even through attending this session. So let's keep in mind that as we travel through Galicia. Okay. My father was born in a small eastern Galician village of Plauchevielka. As a result of economic turmoil in the Austrian Empire, his three older brothers decided to leave Europe and find a new home in America. My three uncles, Burl, Chaim, and Schmerl were preparing to leave for America in 1909. My family were distillers and innkeepers in Plauchevielka. Vielka. In 1910, a law barring Jews from the sale of alcoholic beverages was to go into effect. My father's older brothers made plans to immigrate to America, the land of opportunity. Burl told the others that when he moved to America, he wanted a more American name. He thought for a while and told his brothers that he would be called Buck. <laughs> With that, Chaim agreed this was a good idea and said he would change his name to Chuck. Schmerl thought about this for a while. <laughs> Buck, Chuck, and he decided to stay in Plaucha Vialka. So, today, I will concentrate on Galician records, like the one here of my real Uncle Chaim. I do have a real Uncle Chaim. I will cover birth, marriages, and death records, as well as census records, and how to use them to your advantage. What's going on here? Yeah, I see, okay, got it. This talk is sponsored by Jewish Records Index in Poland, but also spotlights Gesher Galicia as a critical source of data for the audience. Whether you are a novice or experienced researcher, your ability to search your Galician family has been enhanced greatly over the last 10 years. The JRI Poland database had 100,000 Galician records then, 10 years ago. Now the figure is over 1.2 million. 10 years ago, Gesher Galicia didn't even have a database. Now the All Galicia database has over 450,000 records. And there is very little duplication between the contents of the two databases. If there is one thing to take away from this talk, it is to search both databases and support both organizations. Ten years ago, 
copies of vital records were only available on paper through the regional offices of the Polish State Archives or the Ukraine State Archives in Lviv. Now the Polish State Archives are in the midst of digitizing their entire collection of vital records and placing them online to freely view and copy. The vital records at the Ukrainian archive in Lviv have been microfilmed by the LDS Church. <coughs> Digital copies are not available online, but some are viewable at the LDS Family History Centers. Ten years ago, vital records in Poland, 100 years old or less, were not available to the public due to strict laws protecting personal privacy. Last year, the Polish parliament reduced the protection period for marriages and deaths to 80 years. In an instant, marriage and death records from 1916 through 1935 theoretically became available to the public. Some of these 20 years of marriages and death records have been indexed by JRI Poland and are now online. Access by the public and by JRI Poland is subject to the willingness of the civil records office that hold these records to either arrange access or to promptly transfer these records to the archive. I will start with a short history of Galicia and its geography to place your research in perspective. I will show you how to use available resources to find out whether records exist for your ancestral town and where they can be found. I will show you some records and how to help you interpret them. And I will also talk about two very critical and interrelated subjects, civil versus religious marriages and the legitimacy of offspring of those unions, which are very important in understanding your Galicianer ancestry. Okay. So, Before the area was Galicia, it was part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The green outline shows the borders of the Commonwealth in 1771. Before the partitions, before the partitions, the red outline is the current borders of Poland. The blue shaded area is Galicia. Starting in 1772, Poland was partitioned and the Austrian Empire acquired the land that became Galicia. Prior to this, Galicia had no separate identity within the Polish kingdom. Russia and Prussia also participated in the three partitions that ended in 1795 with the elimination of Poland as a country. This map is a map of the Austrian province of Galicia today. Half of Galicia is Poland and half is Ukraine. Between 1772 and World War I, this was the Austrian Empire. From the end of World War I to World War II, this area was all Poland. Mizeda was born in Austria. He died in Poland and is buried in Ukraine, and he never left Tarnopol. Now let's take a short trip through history so that your records can be placed in the proper perspective. Let me first give credit to the person who has passed her knowledge of Jewish Galicia on to me and many others. Susan Wynn is the founder of Gesher Galicia and the author of The Galicia Honors, The Jews of Galicia, 1772 to 1918. Her book, her articles in Avotenu and The Galicia Honor and her postings to Jewish Gen Discussion Forum were all very helpful to me. Soon after Austria acquired the lands to be known as Galicia, the parliament enacted legislation establishing a centralized Jewish self-governing body, which I will refer to as the community. This system was useful to the Austrian crown to communicate with the Jewish community about laws and regulations, to track Jews for official purposes, and to enable government to enforce laws and taxes within the community. The system was also useful to the Jewish community in promoting cohesion, compliance with Jewish law, and organizing for favorable treatment from the crown. When Galicia was annexed by the Austrian Empire, the empire had a very small Jewish presence. However, in these acquired lands, 10% of the population was Jewish. The crown imposed harsh taxes, restrictive laws on many Jewish properties, articles, products, and ceremonies with the objectives to keep the Jewish population small, and encouraged Jews to move elsewhere. In their effort to identify and tax Jews, it was mandated that Jews adopt German surnames by the beginning of 1788. Throughout the early period of Austrian rule, the government worked very hard to assimilate and Germanize the Jews. 
went forward too far. In the mid-19th century, many special taxes were abolished, and by 1869, all Austrian subjects had been emancipated, the last being the Jews of Galicia. Our ancestors slowly became more a part of Austrian society. More Jews were educated in secular schools, attended universities, owned large businesses, served in the Austrian army, and became professionals. By the turn of the 20th century, about half the lawyers in Galicia and a quarter of the doctors were Jewish. Bubby and Zeta's children, Ruchel and Avram, became known as Rosa and Adolf. Their lives became more entwined with the Austrian social and legal system. Before we go any further, I think we should discuss the one immense matter that confounds and frustrates Galiziana researchers. This is the way the Austrian crown dealt with Jewish marriage. I will talk about two critical and interrelated subjects, civil marriage and the legitimacy of offspring. Early in the Austrian rule, an order was instituted allowing only the oldest male in the family to legally marry. Another order in 1810 sought to limit Jewish marriages, decreeing that no Jew could marry unless they passed an exam in religion based on German catechism. In addition, a civil marriage permit was required specifically for Jews that would cost 500 florins or 10% of the family's total wealth, whichever was higher. The Hasidic movement spread rapidly through Galicia and in the 18th century. Roughly six of seven Galician Jews were Hasidim. Marriage became an area of great contention between the crown and the community's Hasidic leadership. For civil marriage, the crown designated one rabbi in each district to perform marriages. For the Jewish communities, government paid rabbis were more secular than the majority Hasidim. The Jewish community was united in resisting the mandate for civil marriage. Even though all these restrictive laws and taxes applying to the Jews were rescinded in the latter part of the 19th century, Jews still resisted civil marriage. The result is that many Jewish marriages were never registered with the civil authorities and were not, will not be found in the JRI Poland or all Galician databases. However, in the early 1880s, mass immigration from Galicia commenced. From 1880 up to World War I, 325,000 Jews left Galicia. Those wanting to emigrate or needing to deal with the legal system in Galicia or their new, uh, or their new homeland wanted papers with both parents' names and use of their ancestral surname. This not only applied to immigration, but also to local activities such as property ownership and inheritance. So what did our Zaydis and Bubbies do? They had a second civil marriage, which was officiated by a crown rabbi. Once this marriage was reg registered, the couple were considered married for legal purposes, but nothing changed within the Jewish community. Now you might ask, how does the lack of a civil marriage impact birth records? As a result of the religious civil marriage difference, children born to those without a civil marriage were considered illegitimate, born without a legal father. Although this designation had no meaning within the Jewish community, it did matter with the civil authorities. For birth considered out of wedlock by the state, by the crown, regulations specified how the father's name was to be recorded. Zeta's name was not to be recorded unless he officially acknowledged paternity. So every time Bubby and Zeta had a child, Zeta would go to the vital records registrar and swear in front of witnesses that he was indeed the father. This meant that his name could be listed on the birth record in the remarks column, not in the father column, and then his signature, with his signature and two witnesses. His name was not supposed to be placed in the father's column and the child was to carry the mother's surname. It turns out that these rules and regulations on how to record the birth of an illegitimate child were not always followed, and the actual recording of these birth events was very, very inconsistent. In some cases, the mother's maiden name was recorded for the child. In some cases, the father's surname was recorded for the child. In most cases, however, no surname was identified for the child. Now let's look at a few examples to see that practice was not always consistent, nor was it in compliance with the law. 
The next three records are all from Kozlov birth registers spanning the period 1878 through 1897. This birth record from 1878 shows that Fea Lea Wegler is the illegitimate daughter of Abraham Wegler, but carries his surname. Abraham's wife, Golda, also carries the Wegler surname. And Abraham has signed a witness declaration of paternity. Is this recorded correctly? No. Okay. By 1883, the registrar had changed. Still the same town. In the first record, a civil marriage exists. Blimey Urban takes the father's surname and Hirsch is listed as a father. Is this recorded correctly? Yes. In the second record on this page, the father is Isaac Sass and he is not recorded and Isaac has the father of Isaac Sass is not recorded, and Isaac has been assigned his mother's Sass surname. Isaac's father, David Mensch, has signed a declaration of paternity which is not witnessed. Is this recorded correctly? No. Okay. By 1897, there was another registrar. Isaac Naaman, Newman, uh, who is illegitimate, is assigned the mother's surname. His father, Jacob Halpern, is listed in the father's column. And he signs a declaration of paternity that's actually witnessed by two men. Is this recorded correctly? No. So we've gone through four records, three are not recorded correctly, one was. As you can see, the registration of illegitimate births, even in the same registration district, are not consistently recorded. Okay. Before we go further, I will share a brief history of Jewish vital records in Galicia. An imperial decree in 1784 mandated civil registration of vital records. The majority Catholic Church was assigned responsibility for the civil record keeping of all minority religions. Where this occurred in other jurisdictions, like Congress Poland, Jewish records were found interspersed with the Catholic records. In Galicia, no Jewish records have been found in any LDS film of Catholic records from this period. The decree specified columnar format, separate registers for births, marriages, and deaths, and certain information including house number, status or legitimacy, the names of the parents, and the names of the parents. Jewish record keeping apparently started in some towns in 1789, coinciding with the issuance of Emperor's Jewish tolerance patent, which granted Jewish Jews limited civil rights that lasted about five years, I think. Uh, there are some records at Polish and Ukraine archives that date back to that year, including Shemesh and Kamyanka Stremolova, but compliance by local Jewish communities was spotty until about the 1850s. All that changed in 1877, when the methods and form for collection of Jewish vital records were finally formalized by law. If Jewish records for your town survived from before 1877, the records were not standardized and they did not have an abundance of data, some just the barest information. Okay. How to find your ancestral town is really beyond the scope of this presentation. So I will assume that you already know the name of your Galician town. How do you determine if vital records for the town exist and if they exist, where can they be found? Jewish records for many towns have survived. Inventories of available Jewish records can be found on both JRI Poland and Gesher Galicia websites, as well as by town on the Roots to, Ra the Roots to Routes Foundation website. That's Miriam Weiner's website. Susan Wynn has provided the best finding aid to locate where Galician town records were registered. In the 1870s, there were about 6,000 towns and villages in Galicia where Jews lived. In 1875, these towns were organized by registration district and subdistrict. Vital records were registered in all district and subdistrict towns. All registration towns except for Lvov and Krakow were registration locations for other nearby towns and villages. Susan located the manual published by the Austrian Justice Ministry, which identifies the Jewish registration districts and towns in each. The list of towns has been alphabetized 
and listed along with its district and subdistrict. So this list is published. Get rid of this again. This list is published in her book as Appendix F. My father was born in this little village of Plaucha Vialka, and Appendix F shows me that in 1877, those Jewish records were registered in the nearby town of Kozlov. Okay. There are three major source, sources for Jewish vital records in Galicia. The Polish State Archives, the Ukraine State Archives branch in Lviv, and the USC offices, the civil records offices in Poland. In Poland, the Polish State Archives holds the majority of vital records that are not protected by privacy laws. The records are held in regional archives in Krakow, with branches in Bochnia, Novi Sanch, and Tarnow, in Chemish, and Jeshov, with a branch in Sanok, and at the Agat Archives in Warsaw, for towns now in Ukraine. All these records have been, or are, available for indexing. Birth records 100 years old or less, as well as marriage and death records 80 years old or less, are held at civil records offices throughout Poland. Privacy protected records from towns now in Ukraine are held at a branch of the Warsaw Civil Records Office. These records are not generally available for indexing or research until they are transferred to an archive. For towns now in Ukraine, the archive in Lviv also holds some records covering the entire period from early 19th century up to World War II. All these records are available for indexing. Long gone are the days where you had to correspond with or visit the archive to research a family. Organizations such as JRI Poland and Gesher Galicia, along with the archives themselves, and Family Search, the genealogy arm of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, have made research easier. So if you are researching Galician Jewish records, start with JRI Poland. JRI Poland has indexed 1.2 million Galician vital records from the various branches of the Polish State Archives. This is the JRI Poland homepage. So click on your town. Next, locate the name of the Jewish registration town that you previously identified in Susan Wynn's book and click on that. By scrolling down, you will find information about the records at the Polish State Archives, what records indices are contained in the online database of JRI, and the status of fundraising, which really impacts on the availability of those record indices. What do we mean by an index entry? For Galician records, entries are extended to show the names, places, and dates that allow researchers to find their family records. And as I will explain later, you can or will soon be able to access an image of that record to obtain all the details. JRI Poland has indexed indexing projects at eight archives covering Gal Galicia. For towns now in Ukraine, the Aged Archive in Warsaw covers 96 registration towns. For towns in Poland, seven archives cover 56 registration towns. In your search, always use both the JRI Poland database and the Gesher Galicia database where the majority of JRI Poland's entries are of vital records from archives in Poland, Gesher Galicia has a wider scope capturing indices and extracts of property, tax, school, and other records. Gesher Galicia does, does have about 300,000 vital records for 59 registration towns, the majority of which are sourced from the Ukraine State Archive in Lviv. There is, again, very little overlap between the database contents of Gesher Galicia and JRI Poland, so I urge you to use both. The All Galician database has a different search facility, and the results are shown differently. The Gesher Galicia website, along with the All Galician database, complements and expands the information available in JRI Poland. Their website is a treasure trove of information specifically geared to Galiciana researchers. In addition to this per presentation, I urge all of you to attend Brooke Schreier's Gans's talk on Thursday morning at 7.30 a.m. entitled Using the Gesher Galicia Website and All Galician Database to Research Towns and Families. And another session of note is uh, Tomasz Jankowski's Records on Migration in the Archives of Galicia, which is tomorrow morning at 7.30. So you're going to have to get up early for those two. 
Before 1877, there were no standard form headings. The headings were in Latin, Polish, or German. They differed from town to town and year to year. This changed in 1877 when headers, headings were standardized and provided in both Polish and German, as shown here. JRI Poland has translated these headings to English, and the website address is listed in my syllabus handout. Registrars were required to record the information either in Polish or German. This marriage register page from Skalat is recorded in German. The names and towns are written in Latin letters, which we can all read. However, the other information is written in German. But this is the old German script called Zitelen, or Deutsche Schrift, and not easy to decipher. You can try and decipher the words, and Family Search has a research wiki on German handwriting that you can use. Or you can post the script on Jewish Gen Viewmate or a Facebook group called Genealogy Translations, which you must join to use. If you are lucky, your family records will be recorded in Polish, like this Tarnopol marriage register. With a Polish dictionary and Google Translate, you should be able to translate these records yourself. However, beware, not all handwriting is, is as legible as this record, and you may still need that Facebook page. Okay. Now let's turn our attention to the actual records and what you may find in them. Records from before 1877 have limited information, and the format and fields of data are not consistent. I will show some examples. This 1824 Tarnopol birth record is in columnar format, but has no headings at all. The record includes the child's full name, house number, name, sex, legitimacy status, father's given name, mother's given name, and mother's father's given name. This 1869 Brijani birth record has headings that are in Latin. It appears the Brijani Jewish registrar just used the Catholic church form. This 1858 Husiatin marriage record has very little information, including here are the names of the bride and the groom and their father's given names. That is it. Most pre-1877 marriage records have very little limited information. Older death records also do not have a great deal of family information. This 1872 Kapachinsi uh, record lists the names of the deceased, dates of death, the house number where death occurred, sex, age of death, and cause of death. Now let's turn our attention to vital records starting in 1877. This is a whole new world of reporting. Ah. Okay. We will start with the records that have the least genealogical information and work our way to those that have the best information and surprises. Death records have the least amount of family information. I keep doing that. Okay. Starting in 1877, death workers, records were to include date of recording, page of entry, name of examiner, exact time and place of death, day and place of burial, name of deceased, marital status, occupation, town of residence, sex, age, and cause of death. What names other than a deceased are usually recorded on a Galician death record? This is a typical group of death records from Scalat in 1892. The first entry is for a 36-year-old male. For men, the only information provided are name, occupation, and town of residence. The second entry is for a nine-year-old child. For children, the names of a parent or both parents and their town of residence are usually recorded. The last entry is for my great-great-grandmother, who died at, the, at 70 years of age, of old age. I really do not think 70 is old. Do you? Do you? No. <laughs> for married women, the death record usually shows only their husband's name and town of residence. However, it always pays to view the record, as there may be more information. So, 
was 70 old age in 1892. They say it was. Today, the oldest person alive is 116-year-old Emma Morano of Italy, who was born in 1899. And the oldest man alive is 112-year-old Auschwitz survivor Israel Kristol of Haifa, born in 1903. J.R.I. Poland was instrumental in proving, providing the proof of Israel's age. This is a 1907 Kamianka death record for Hani Fege Eisenberg, who died at age 112. She was born in 1795, or about 1795. Her parents were Leib and Rebecca Erlitz, who were both born before Jews adopted surnames. From the JRI Poland database, Hani Fege's husband, Hirsch Leib, predeceased her by 22 years at the young age of 96. So even back then, people lived to the ripe old age. So next up are marriage records. You will recall that your ancestor's marriage record might not be found as most Jews had religious marriages that were not recognized by the Austrian crown and could not be recorded in the civil marriage registers. Marriage records starting in 1877 were to include for both bride and groom their name, place of birth, occupation, place of residence, parents' names, age, and marital status. Also, date and location of the marriage, signature of a civil official, his title and his place of residence, and witness names and place of residence. When couples or their children had a need for a civil marriage, second marriages in front of a crown rabbi were to be arranged. This is a 1904 Sambor civil marriage of 76-year-old Mechel Oberlander to 75-year-old Rivka Vein. When looking through the other Sambor records, we find three children born between 1859 and 1870 who themselves were married in civil ceremonies before 1900. What event or events compelled this marriage? Well, Mechel died five months later, so it is likely that inheritance of his estate compelled this marriage. So whether he was horizontal or vertical when he was married, we don't know. <laughs> Many marriage records have good genealogical information. Let's look at the 1896 marriage from Tarnopol. The, the groom, uh, Jakob Schwadron, was born in Burstyn and lives in Zlachov, the son of Isaac and Pessy. The bride is Ida Halpern, born in Skalat and living in Tarnopol, the daughter of Jacob and Rebecca. That's a lot of information already, but the notes show more. The third note verifies the completion of the groom's military service. So here is another line of research. And the fourth note is certification for the groom from the rabbi in the town of Zabarov, another town, uh, and we can surmise that the groom had connections or roots in Zabarov, and I was able to prove that. This last marriage record is very unusual. This is a 1931 Drohobich civil marriage of Antony Kazimir Sovchinsky, age 25, son of Michal Sovchinsky and Theodos Harichai. Already you are wondering about this groom. The record shows that Antony converted under rabbinic supervision from Roman Catholicism to Judaism and changed his given name to Abraham. His bride is Rachel Bernstein, age 21, daughter of Henny Rose Bernstein and Avraham David Bergman. Birth records have the most valuable genealogical information. In Galicia, as well as many other jurisdictions, a person's birth record was used to record changes in civil status of that individual. Therefore, when civil events change the status of a person, a note might be added or appended to the original record. Many of these notes are genealogical gold. I will provide some examples later. Birth records starting in 1877 were to include the date and location of the birth and the bris or naming, the child's name, sex, and legitimacy status, the father's name, occupation, and place of residence, the mother's name, civil marriage status, occupation, parents' names, and place of residence, signature of official or witnesses, and their places of residence, signature of the moil and his place of residence, signature of the midwife and her place of residence, and a report of stillbirth or infant birth if applicable, uh, of death, I'm sorry, not birth, death. 
On my Uncle Chaim's birth record, I have highlighted two columns for house numbers. The first being the house number of the birth, and the second being the house number of the bris. You will also find house numbers on death records signifying the place of death. It appears that registrars from the earliest records, remember 1789, uh, through 1930s recorded the house number or address of births and deaths. You should always note the house number as they are also recorded on other records such as tabula registers, notary records, property records, and homeowner lists. House numbers can be used to track movements of your ancestors, to identify or confirm possible connections between families or family names, and possibly to locate the ancestral home of your family. Two warnings in using house numbers. House numbers in sequence are not necessarily near each other. Once the numbers were established, new houses were assigned the next sequential number, no matter the location. And second warning is that house number in records are not necessarily the place of residence. They are the place of birth, the place of bris, or the place of death. This is a typical entry for the father. It provides his name, his occupation, and his town of residence. Remember, when the parents did not have a civil marriage, the father's name should not be recorded, or his name and statement of paternity should be in the far right column. If it wasn't a far right column, it did not have his occupation or town of residence. Very seldom will you find more information about the father, but it is always worth looking. This father's entry is in this 1878 Zhirovno birth record reads Nuta Rice, married son of Abraham, Hirsch, and Rivka from Zorovno, a peddler in the town of Zorovno. So it does give his parents' names. The mother's parents' name, occupation, and place of residence are almost always recorded. So try and find records where the mother's family is important to you. This 1885 Sambor birth uh, reads Rosa Turk Mamelis, wife of Samson Mamelis from Sambor, and daughter of Hirsch and Dina Turk from Baranovce. When a person's birth record was used to record changes in civil status for that individual, notes would be added to the birth record, as you can see in this illustration. Many of these are genealogical gold. Here are a few examples. I will repeat again, always look at the record. This is a page from the 1901 Tarnopol birth register. This first record shows that Usher Horowitz died in February 1902, about a year old. The second record shows that in 1915, the parents of Gittel Spiegelglass presented their Vienna marriage certificate to the registrar, thus changing Gittel's status from illegitimate to legitimate. The third record shows that Max's parents, Mendel Jaeger and Bela Ehrenkrantz, had their civil marriage registered in Tarnopol in April 1903, making Max legitimate. This fourth record shows that Henny Schifra Adlerstein was married in Tarnopol in 1927, and that record can be found on page 118 in the marriage register for that year. The note on the right says that in 1926, just before Henny's marriage, the parents' surnames were changed. Follow this. Mother from, was changed from Ruthen to Shore. Father was changed from Bitzler to Adler, Adlerstein. By checking other Tarnopol records, I find that both parents were born illegitimate, but were recorded in this birth record with their father's surname, recorded wrongly with their father's surname. This note corrected the surnames to the mother's surnames 25 years later. So this may be confusing, but this is one record provides a good deal of genealogical information. Okay. The fifth record shows two subsequent events for David Leib Schwartz, the 1940, 14 civil marriage of his parents, he's now legitimate, and his 1928 civil marriage. Each of these five records has been amended but do not expect that every record will contain new facts. In my experience, about a quarter to a third of these records after 1877 will have some notation on them. This next record is a Tarnopol birth record from 1863. 
Being old, the record does not have the standard look we have been look, uh, looking at. Uh, this is the birth of my Zeta, Moses Halpern. The note above the entry says that Moses died on April 17, 1937 in Tarnopol. I knew my grandmother emigrated to America in 1938 after her husband passed, but this confirms the story and provides a your site date for me. This record is the 1904 Glignani birth of Shrul Feibisch, son of Naftuli Heller and Nessie Reinhertz. The subsequent note states that in 1925, at age 21, Shrul was adopted by Abraham Reinhertz and Fage Genser, his uncle and aunt. This record is the 1911 Kalamea birth of Eliash, son of Shulam Hilsenrad and Toba Weinreb. The note states that in November 1953, after the war, Elias changes his name, his given name, to Massier, and his parents' given name to Simon and Antoinette. Were his parents alive or deceased when their sons changed their names? We don't know. The note on the left may, may show the reason for the name change, as Elias married Dorota Freilich in September 1953. Was Dorota Jewish? Did Elias convert? Again, we don't know. But here are some more avenues of research for the genealogist. This last birth record we will look at is a 1907 Drahobich birth of Arthur, the legitimate, legitimate son of Dr. Mordko Sen Senensib, an attorney, and Leonie Trachtenberg. In 1919, the re record was amended. Arthur's name was changed to Tadius Zidnitsky and he converted to Roman Catholicism. Okay. Census type records are a great resource for families as they provide a snapshot of the family and their neighborhood. Unfortunately, there are few surviving enumeration documents for Galician towns. We will, walk, we will talk about Austrian censuses, which dates from 1857 through 1910, and books of residence, census type records in the Republic of Poland after World War I. Okay. Censuses of all the population of the Austrian Empire were taken in, uh, no, I'm ahead of myself, okay. Censuses of all the population of Austrian Empire were taken in 1857, 1869, 1880, 1890, 1900, and 1910. After the information was compiled, the, the enumerations were destroyed. Only the statistical data from these censuses survive, with a few exceptions. The chart is from 1900 census compilation showing the tax, tax district of Kozava within the administrative district of Prizani. This shows that 10% of this tax, this tax district were Jewish, 30% were Roman Catholic, and 60% were Greek, Greek Catholic. Many of the surviving censuses are identified here. The highlighted ones have been or will be indexed by JRI Poland or Gesher Galicia. This is a page from the 1910 Auschwitz census. The Germans named this town Auschwitz. The Austrian census captured names, ages, places of birth, district of registration, religion, social standing, languages spoken, literacy, and occupation for every member of the household. So if, you come, if your family comes from this town, there are no vital records, but these census records are great, and there, I think, are four of these censuses that have been enumerated and have been or will be indexed. This is a page from the 1910 Jewish census of Tarnopol. The entire census is found in the Oblast archive in Tarnopol. Gesher Galicia has indexed the entire census and also has images of the page if you become a qualified contributor. This census and the index include surname, given name, date, and place of birth, district of registration, occupation, and relationship to head of household. After Poland was reconstituted as a country following World War I, Poland-wide censuses were taken in 1921 and 1931. And guess what? those enumerations were also destroyed. So I don't know of any exceptions. There might be, but I don't know of any. 
But starting in 1931 and continuing in until World War II, each community in Poland, including all towns formerly in Galicia, were required to maintain books of residence, census-like records of all legal residents of that town. These were huge volumes organized by house number or addresses that recorded the comings and goings of the residents of the community. Books of residence had been maintained in Congress Poland from about 1850. So those of you with ancestry also in Congress Poland know how valuable these books can be. Up until a couple of years ago, I had never seen such books in Galicia. A dedicated researcher with roots in Zalashiki visited her town and asked where the records were. She was directed to the local museum where two such volumes were found. She reported her findings to JRI Poland, uh, and we immediately contracted to photograph these volumes. JRI has an index prepared and is raising funds to pay for the indexing. More of these books or other genealogical materials must be out there. When you travel to Ukraine or Poland, to your ancestral town and village, you can help by asking about records at archives, civil records offices, museums, cultural societies, and similar organizations. Let JRI Poland know, and we can arrange to digitize those records. Zalashiki is a town in southeast Galicia near Kolomea. The Jewish vital records for this town have not survived, so this is a real mitzvah for Zalashiki researchers. There are two complete volumes, but they represent only part of the town's population. This is a page for Jacob Halpern and his family. They are not my family. However, there is a connection. I needed information from Japan, of all places, for another project I was working on, which will be a subject of my talk uh, at Thursday at 3 p.m., uh, promotional commercial here. I connected with Jack Halpern, a linguist living in Japan for over 40 years, who had founded the Japanese Yiddish Club. We talked on the phone, and I got around to asking about his roots. Jacob is Jack's grandfather and his namesake. His son, Feibisch, survived the Holocaust, and Jack was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany. I am always looking for these connections. So now he has the record. Now that you have seen the records and understand that having the actual record is so important for your genealogical research, let's see how you can obtain a copy. The Polish State Archives is in the midst of a project to digitize all vital records at all archive branches. You know, the Jewish records are maybe 10% or less of those records. Some archives, such as Agad for Ukraine records from Galicia, uh, Shemesh and Tarnov are moving ahead rapidly and have many scans online. Others, like Krakow and Zheshev, are moving fairly slowly. This chart shows which town's vital records have been digitized and are online. And are online. When JRI learns that a new record images are online, we create links to the folder for that town, to a nearby web page, or to the actual web page containing the actual image. The Polish State Archive, through their National Digital Archive branch, has set up a common website to host these images. All the regional archives can choose to use the website or to set up their own website. Agad has chosen to set up their own website. Shemis has used a combination of their own website and the common website. The other regional archives in Galicia use the common website. Let's look at two of these websites. Okay. First, you need to identify the record of interest by searching the JRI Poland database. To look at Agad, I will replicate one of my personal searches. I performed a search for the surname Tenenbaum in Galicia, which resulted in over 3,500 matching entries. This is a result table for the town of Shemeshlane, now in Ukraine. I was intrigued by one entry, the 1906 birth of uh, David, whose father's surname is Tenenbaum and mother's surname is Halpern, the surnames of my paternal grandparents who were from nearby Tarnopol. I have a great interest to see this record to help determine if this is my family. The record is AKT number 42. It's a 42nd record in the 1906 births. The image link at the left of the entry says view nearby image. So I click on that. The record image that pops up shows 1906 births AKT number 33 to 36, 
but I'm looking for 42. So using the navigation arrows at the bottom of that frame, the previous slide, the frame there, uh, I move ahead two images to find record number 42. And this is the record. Unfortunately, additional information tells me that this is very unlikely that this is my family. For the AGAD records of towns near Ukraine, many of the entries in the JRI Poland database show a link. I have demonstrated how view nearby image works. For some towns, the index entry now links directly to the actual record, and those links say view image. One click and you're at the image. Okay. Except for Agad, the vast majority of Galician records and also records from other areas of Poland will be found on the website run by the National Digital Archives. Uh, and this is called shukaivarkivak.pl. We will use a Tarnov birth record as our example. I will run through this seven step process very quickly, very quickly. I find this website very user unfriendly. <laughs> JRI has and will make the process easier. First, we have created a guide to using the National Digital Archive website. There is a link and a URL in my syllabus handout. Secondly, in the future, we will link all index entries, if possible, to the actual web page where the record resides. Now, this is not going to happen overnight. It's going to take years to do this because you have to enter the, the website address in every entry individual. Okay. So we find our birth record and click the link in the header, which takes us to the folder of the Tarno record. At the next web page, we click on units. At the next web page, click on the year and type of record you are targeting. Uradzin is birth. At the next web page, click on digital copies. Now, there's a web page with thumbnails of all the records. And your targeted record, find your targeted record amongst, uh, this says eight pages. There could be 50 pages. This says eight pages. So find your targeted record and click on that one, and it'll bring up your record. But to look closer, you have to click the enlarge icon, which uh, is circled here. And then, down below, you can download it to your own computer. So as I said, this is a seven-stage process right now. So I wish that the Polish State Archives had consulted with JRI Poland or AGAD before creating this Rube Goldberg website. If you don't know the meaning of Rube Goldberg, the common definition is accomplishing something simple through complicated means. Okay. Before I sum up and close, I need to take a minute to honor Pamela Weisberger who was the president of Gesher Galicia up until her untimely death last September. She was one of the smartest, most energetic, and most creative genealogists I have known. The last time I saw Pamela was at the Jerusalem Conference in July 2015. The photo on the right shows 10 Galicianers near the Western Wall after a tour of the Kotel Tunnels, which was arranged by Pamela. Many of my references to Gesher Galicia today might not have been but for Pamela. Tonight, the Jewish Genealogical Society of Los Angeles, which Pamela served for many years, will honor her with the inaugural Pamela Weisberger Memorial Lecture. So please join the genealogical community in recognizing Pamela by attending this lecture tonight at 7.30. 7.30, 8.30, 30. But also go to Jewish Gen, which is at seven o'clock. Okay. <laughs> now, the Halpern rules for research in Galicia, they're pretty easy but you gotta follow them. Always use both JRI Poland and Gesher Galicia in researching a Galician family. Make an effort to understand and then consider the civil versus religious marriage issue when evaluating your records. Beware, the ways that events were recorded were inconsistent between towns and between registrars in the same town. That means that if you found the record you're looking for, go back and look at that person for that person's brother or sister and see what that record says to confirm what the first record said okay always look at the record repeat always look at the record you do not want to miss any surprises and lastly be a detective look for those connections and speaking of connections let's look at one last record 
This is the 1892 Lvov birth of Grover Cleveland Blumenfeld. Grover Cleveland Blumenfeld, born in 19th century Lemberg, the son of Zygmunt or Samuel Blumenfeld and Carola Buber. The record states that both parents lived in Chicago, so possibly explains the naming of their son. But why was he born in Lemberg? I don't know. For those who do not know Grover Cleveland, since this is an international community. He was the President of the United States from 1885 to 1889, and then again from 1893 to 1897. I wonder if a baby born today in Lviv might be called Barack Obama Shapiro, <laughs> or maybe Benjamin Netanyahu Katz. So this is Benjamin Franklin. Does anybody know where, uh, where Grover Cleveland was born? That's Grover Cleveland. What did I say? I'm sorry. I'm from Philadelphia. Why did, why, why did I say that? This is Grover Cleveland. Does anybody know where he was born? Very good. He lived in Ohio. He was born in Caldwell, New Jersey. <laughs> That's right. He was the most famous person ever to live in Caldwell. Does anybody know who the second most famous person to live in Caldwell was? You know. You must know. No, this guy. Tony Soprano, the fictional Moffat prime boss, lived in North Caldwell, New Jersey. And the third most famous person to ever live in Caldwell was a Jew. <laughs> so this is my connection to the Blumenfelds of Lemberg. Now, your questions, please. Uh, please use the microphone so that the erudite questions you ask and the questionable answers I give can be heard. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> on the marriage records, did the, was the bride's surname the mother's name or the father's name or a combination? Uh -huh. um, I saw where you said they yep. changed the parents' names in one thing back to their mother's names instead of paternal. Yeah. But on our typical marriage, uh, what would it be? And so I have one other question about downloading the images. I have a great deal of problem. Can I answer the first one downloading. first? Downloading, yeah. Because otherwise I'll forget it. Right. No, yeah. So the, f the first one is, is problematic. You know, the, the child takes the mother's surname. What surname does the mother take, assuming that her parents didn't have a civil marriage? In most cases that I've seen, they give the father's name to it, but sometimes the mother's name. It is just not consistent at all. You need to do research. You have to need, look at other records to find out who was the mother, who was the father of the mother of the, of the child born. It's very complicated. It doesn't go back directly in line. I found uh, a Tarnopol census. Uh, I, I found that uh, a lot of my family, uh, including uh, uh, my grandfather uh, and his brothers and sisters, were born in a certain house number in uh, Tarnopol. It turns out that he and a lot of his cousins were born in his grandparents' house in Tarnopol. So I said I wanted to find the 1890 census for that house because I knew that my great-great-grandfather had died by 1910. I found the census. It listed a family named Yaroshover, not Sass, the Sass family I expected. But if you think about it, you know, the, uh, this was uh, uh, his wife, uh, Bela Sass. Her maiden name was Yaroshover. I didn't know that. I found it out by looking at the house number. But in all the other records, it showed her as Bela, daughter of Avram Sass and, some, and uh, uh, Leah Sass. So in one record, it says, use her father's name. In another record, it used her mother's name. You need to do more research. You can't rely on the, the record itself. Uh, uh, the surname of, of, of anybody until you look at other records. Yeah. And the second question. Uh, the second question, well, it also leads me, I have a record where there is an R in it, or a V, okay. which gives both names. So that leads me yeah. to um, what the maiden name was, is one of the two names listed. Um, Solomon uh, Weintraub R. Spindle. Yeah. 
you know, so okay. I, I knew one of them was mother, one was father. Yeah, the other you, question was about downloading images and also the index pages. And I find a great deal of problem doing that when I can see an image or especially the index page from JRI. So I'm not sure well, how to do that. I'm talking about Galician records and there are no index pages in the Galician records. So uh, I JRI really Poland records. But JRI index. Poland does have, you know, records from Congress Poland have index pages. And uh, you know, the only way to download them that I know of is to go through that process and find that actual image. No, I'm talking about I can see the JRI index page. I want to download that index page. Oh, the, or the, I want to I see the oh, image. Oh, the index page. The image, uh, let's say, from Brajani or something. You can see the image, and I want to download that image. Do a print screen. Okay. Yeah, you know, screen capture. All right. It's, a, it's the easy way. The, uh, the other thing is, is the RNV, the RNV and F between names. You asked about that? Okay. Uh, R is for recti, it's uh, Latin. F is for false, which is also Latin, and V is for vel. Uh, R recti means incorrect. You know, so it would say a surname, incorrect, this. So they were using the wrong name, which is shown second. They should have been using the first one. The opposite of that is F is false, and it goes the opposite way. And V is just like also known as. So they might use both names. And usually that's used not for a surname, but for a given name. I hope that helps. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just a small comment about translating your own uh, data from these columnar images. One of the problems I found that I didn't realize was that when the scribes were writing it, they often broke words wherever. No indication <laughs> of any type of hyphenation. The word was just broken and I'd be trying to in interpret part of a word that wasn't really a word because I'd missed a, a Z on the previous line. <laughs> so that was uh, uh, something that I learned the hard way uh, to do it yourself. That's, that's a good comment. Uh, so the other thing that I've noticed with uh, some of the um, records, the language, uh, first of all, can change. You can have them recorded in German. I'm looking mainly at Drohobic, uh, Borislav. They, they'll be German. Then they'll be Polish. And sometimes you will have on the same record at different times you'll have German uh, and, and Polish, or vice versa, one before the other, so. It was, up, it was up to the town and the registrar, so you change registrars, they decided to use a different, uh, they were more comfortable with German, let's say, versus uh, Polish, or vice versa. So, you know, you, you never know. They were allowed to use either one, and each registrar chose what they wanted to use. But the good thing is they always wrote the surnames and the town names in Latin letters, so you could make those out. Yeah, yeah. okay, thanks. Okay, that's it, thank you very much.